Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, topics expected to be on the agenda at the Summit of the Americas uh, as it gets underway include trade, security and migration. Panama's President Juan Carlos Varela called on the heads of state to put aside their differences. Well, for more, we're joined by two guests. In Claremont, California, Miguel Tinker Salas is with us, professor of Latin American history at Pomona College. His new book is Venezuela, What Everyone Needs to Know. You can read the introduction on our website at democracynow.org. And in Washington, D.C., we're joined by Mark Weisbrot, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research and president of Just Foreign Policy. His article in The Hill is headlined, Obama could face disastrous summit due to Venezuela sanctions. We welcome you both back to Democracy Now! Um, but let us begin with Miguel Tinker Salas. Uh, on this eve of the summit, the uh, kerfuffle around whether the possibility of Venezuela being put on the terrorist list and President Obama pulling back from that, saying they don't consider, while they had originally said they do consider Venezuela a threat to national security. What's behind all of this? Well, I think fundamentally it's the changes in Latin America. Um, the reality is that the summit is really at a crossroads. It begins in 1994, presided by Bill Clinton, as a proposal to implement the free trade for the Americas uh, and take NAFTA into the entire region. The reality is that by 2001 in Quebec, you have Hugo Chavez at the summit criticizing free trade for the Americas and the imposition of an asymmetrical order. Uh, and by 2005, that entire process is directly when you have the fundamental changes in Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, and Ecuador. So the summit is really at a crossroads in terms of what it seeks to accomplish. The U.S. is trying to regain ground by uh, establishing better relations with Cuba and coming into the 20th century, in fact, the 21st century. But the reality is that the arrogance of the U.S. on the question of Venezuela threatened to derail the entire process again. So I think that what is behind all this is really what is the role of the summit of the Americas, what is the role of the OAS at a time in which you have other institutions in Latin America, like the Union of South American Nations and the community of Latin American and Caribbean nations that do not include the U.S.? So I think it's really at a crossroads in terms of what its future will be. And uh, Mark Weisbrot, what about this? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Americas is no longer the backyard of the United States, as it was historically known as a, a, an area that was exploited and dominated uh, by Washington. No, that's right. And the, the Obama administration hasn't really recognized that. I think that's the big thing. You know, uh, Rafael Correa, president of Ecuador, responded to the March 9th uh, sanctions executive order saying, you know, this reminds us of the darkest hours of our America when we received dictatorships uh, from imperialism. And uh, don't they understand that Latin America has changed, he said. And they don't. And that's been the problem all along. That's the problem with these summits. You know, in 2012, uh, and Miguel gave a very nice history, in 2012, uh, everybody said, including uh, President Santos of Colombia, that there wasn't going to be another summit without Cuba. So Obama comes along uh, in December and says, well, you know, we're going to give them a pr Christmas present. We're going to, uh, you know, begin the process of normalization, normalizing relations with Cuba. And then uh, he comes with these sanctions on March 9th, and everybody realized, well, he's not really changed anything at all. And the, you get these statements from the CELOC, which includes every country in uh, the hemisphere except for the U.S. and Canada, saying, you know, he's got to rescind this executive order. And then, uh, and from UNASUR as well. So now you see the White House backing off, and you see the White House saying, well, no, we didn't really, you know, we, we, we not only said that Venezuela was a, an extraordinary threat to national security, but we actually declared a national emergency because of this threat. That was written in the executive order, and now the White House says, no, well, you know, it's not a threat at all. Well, First of all, what does that say about the rule of law in the United States? I mean, this was an executive order. They had to put that in there for because that law is there for a reason. You're not supposed to impose unilateral sanctions. Actually, it violates the OAS charter, among other things. You know, unless there is a real security threat. So this was a, a real admission. This was a real defeat for them, and they're backing off, just like the uh, you know coming into the 21st century on Cuba is backing off. But they still don't really recognize that there's a new reality in the region. And that's why I think 
uh, it doesn't look that good yet uh, going forward. Among those attending the summit is U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, Roberta Jacobson. Last week, she said she was surprised few countries had defended U.S. sanctions against Venezuela. I was a bit, I will confess, disappointed that there weren't more who defended the fact that clearly this was not intended to hurt the Venezuelan people or the Venezuelan government even as a whole and did not more clearly explain or elucidate as we did for them in advance, because we did talk to governments in advance of the sanctions, um, that this was really very, very narrowly targeted. In March, all 33 members of the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, known as CELAC, expressed opposition uh, to the U.S. sanctions against Venezuela. Um, Miguel Tinker Salas, your response to um, one of the representatives, the U.S. representative, of course, President Obama will be there, too, uh, in Panama. Well, I think it merely mirrors what happened in the 2012 summit in Colombia. There's a certain arrogance behind a statement that you're disappointed about the fact that Latin American leaders did not support the U.S. on sanctions. Did they really think that the U that Latin American leaders were going to ally with the U.S. and support sanctions against Venezuela? They may criticize Venezuela privately. Um, they may Colombia, Mexico, which are the clearest allies the U.S. has in Latin America. America, no doubt may criticize Venezuela, but they're not going to publicly express that criticism. So if the U.S. is disappointed, it really deflects an arrogance concerning Latin America and their inability to comprehend how, in fact, the region has changed. This is not just about Venezuela. This is about Latin America. This is about a region declaring its independence, declaring its autonomy, its respect for the rule of law, its respect for sovereignty, its respect for democratically elected governments. And I think that when Roberta Jacobson and others in the administration or the Washington think tanks criticize other leaders in Latin America, it's a refusal to recognize the extent to which Latin America has changed, to which it's not willing to be the backyard, to which there are other players in the region. China is an important economic actor in the region. So are European countries. And I think it really does reflect that sense that Latin America is still our backyard. And then, therefore, they're really trying to backpedal because they really want to avoid a repeat of what happened in Cartagena, where Obama was isolated on Cuba, isolated on immigration, isolated on the question of the drug war, criticized by friends and foes alike. Um, and he came back and fired his national security advisor on Latin America. So I think that there really should be some heads to roll here as a result of what has happened, the debacle the U.S. has got itself into. And I think that really does reflect the arrogance that still exists on the part of the U.S. Well, uh, Mark, why but on this issue of damage control that, uh, uh, that's been occurring in the last week or two, uh, we reported uh, yesterday here on the decision of the United States government to uh, expert, uh, extradite uh, 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 to deport. Uh, uh, General Carlos Eugenio Vides Casanova, who was linked uh, to the uh, not only to torture, but then to the the killings of the church women, the four church women in El Salvador, and also the decision to initiate extradition proceedings against uh, Colonel Inocente Orlando Montano Morales, who was uh, implicated in the killing of Jesuit priests, Spanish Jesuit priests, and who is now facing uh, judicial uh, a p potential trial in Spain. So you have these two. Uh, actions just in the days before Obama heads to the summit, and also the reports that uh, that Secretary of State Kerry sent an emissary to Venezuela to try to patch things up uh, uh, privately. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think they really realize they've made a big, big mistake. And I, I, I you know, Miguel's right. I mean, I, I, they live in some kind of bubble. I don't know who they're talking to in these governments. You know, I remember talking to a foreign minister a couple of years ago. I won't mention his name. Uh, or country, because it was a private conversation. But he said, you know, uh, when the U.S. is going to do something in Africa, uh, they at least talk to the governments in the region and ask them what they think about it. And they don't even do that in Latin America. And, you know, this is how everybody sees it. There's a huge gap between what any government knows 
in the you know in the region about U.S. policy, and uh, what you have in the media, and therefore what most people uh, know. It's it's enormous. And you know, in 2009, of course, and, and you know, I'm thinking about this because you know, you might get a, a handshake. Uh, and a picture between uh, Raul Castro and, and President uh, Obama and uh, in this uh, summit. And you had that with uh, Obama and Chavez in 2009, and it went all over the place and it actually upset some of, uh, you know, the administration's right-wing uh, allies. And so the very next day, uh, they poured cold water all over it and made sure, made it, you know, with some insults and made sure that this wasn't going to lead to any thawing of relations. And then, of course, there was the military coup in Honduras in 2009, in, the, in June. Uh, and after that, after the U.S. did everything it could uh, to support, uh, to make sure that coup succeeded and to legitimize the elections that nobody else in the hemisphere would recognize uh, for that uh, dictatorship, uh, that was really it. You know, then everybody realized, well, this wasn't, you know, going to change. This was really as bad and possibly even worse as the Bush policies in uh, Latin America. Now, you know, uh, Mark, Obama's I want to interrupt for one legacy. minute uh, before we really get into the significance of Cuba being there. You wrote about Hillary Clinton's um, involvement in the coup, or at least in support of the coup in Honduras. Now, this weekend, she's going to be announcing um, uh, that she will be a candidate for president of the United States. Can you just briefly summarize, as secretary of state, what was her position at the time? Well, it was interesting. I mean, uh, she wouldn't say, you know, like a couple of days after the coup, uh, she was asked by the media if restoring democracy in Honduras, which she said she supported, meant restoring the democratically elected president. And she wouldn't answer that question. And, of course, the White House had put out a statement on the day of the coup, uh, which didn't even oppose the coup. That told every diplomat in Washington, of course, that, uh, you know, that was the strongest statement you can make in the 21st century in favor of the coup. And, the you know, ousting president of Zelaya. Yeah, the ousting of Salai. And, you know, Salai was on your show, you remember. He said the U.S. was actually involved in the coup, and there's every reason to believe that, given what they did in those six months following it. And then, in her book, she uh, very much admits that she uh, acted uh, with others, uh, you know, her, her few allies in the OAS, uh, to, she, I think she used the word, render the question of Salai's return moot. In other words, to make sure that that wasn't uh, going to happen. Uh, and and they use the OAS, and that's why you have. Uh, I think that's the main reason why you have the community of Latin American and Caribbean nations without the U.S. and Canada specifically formed, because of her uh, manipulation of the OAS to stop them from taking uh, stronger action, which everyone else, just about everyone else in the hemisphere, supported to restore uh, Celia to office. Uh, Miguel Tinkersalas, I'd like to ask you about the issue of uh, Cuba, but this is President Obama speaking Thursday about whether the U.S. will remove Cuba from its terrorist watch list. As you know, there's a process involved in reviewing uh, whether or not a country should be on the state sponsor terrorism list. Uh, that review has been completed at the State Department. It is now forwarded to the White House. Our interagency team will go through the entire thing and then present it to me uh, with a recommendation. That hasn't happened yet. Miguel Tinkersalas, what about this uh, uh, removal of Cuba from the, uh, the list of nation sponsoring terrorists? Well, a list that the U.S. created and the U.S. put Cuba on it, it, I think it's really a political fig leaf on the part of Obama. He wants to be able to hide behind something, come to the summit, deliver something. The reality is that the U.S. for the U.S., Cuba for the U.S. really became an impediment. It, it increased its isolation in the region. The U.S. has other interests in the region. They would really like to have a discussion about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. They would like to have an alliance about the free trade for the Americas. They would like to promote what are really their 
economic interest. So that the issue of Cuba is really a vestige of the past. It is part of a Cold War legacy. It has both national implications in the U.S., but it has more importantly international implications. The U.S. is isolated on Cuba in the U.N. Only two countries vote for its support of an embargo. It's isolated in Latin America. It's isolated in Europe, Africa, Asia. So really the Cuba issue has become a really an impediment, a block for the U.S. Uh, in the region. So the U.S. has increased its military presence in the region. It would like to really have a, a discussion about the FTA and economic interests. So I think that essentially jettison uh, the old Cuba policy while trying to maintain sanctions, while trying to keep Cuba on a terror list, uh, really put it in a contradiction. Latin Americans reject the idea of the U.S. putting Latin American countries on a terror list. They also reject the U.S. putting Latin American countries on a list of which ones are allies on the drug war when the U.S. is the largest consumer of illegal drugs in the world. A sort of hypocrisy there. So I think that there is a, a rejection to that. That's why you've had the Union of South American Nations, the Community of Latin American and Caribbean Nations, the ALBA, the Bolivian Alliance, and that's why you've had such a rejection to the Obama policy of sanctions on Venezuela, because the real effort was to make Venezuela the new Cuba, to relieve sanctions against Cuba, to open relations with Cuba, to normalize relations, um, while at the same time keeping uh, uh, some aspect of sanctions against Venezuela, placating the right in the U.S., placating the right within the Democratic Party, and the whole issue has backfired and threatened to derail the entire summit. We want to thank you both for being with us. Of course, we'll continue to cover this historic summit that's taking place in Panama. Miguel Tinker Salas, professor of Latin American history at Pomona College. His new book is called Venezuela, What Everyone Needs to Know. And you can read the introduction at democracynow.org. And we will link to his article in the progressive headlined U.S. Alone once again at America's Summit. And thanks so much to Mark Weisbrot, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, president of Just Foreign Policy. We'll link to your piece in The Hill, Obama Could Face disaster summit due to Venezuela sanctions, though clearly the U.S. has pulled back on those. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, a Democracy Now! exclusive, a father of one of the Mexican young men who disappeared in the state of Guerrero last September. Stay with us.